In our previous video, we introduced the fundamentals of REST APIs and discussed why they have become the backbone of modern web and application development. Today, we'll take a deeper dive into a critical piece of the REST API puzzle, HTTP methods. HTTP methods are at the heart of how REST APIs work. Without a solid understanding of these methods, it's nearly impossible to design or consume REST APIs effectively. Let's break them down, explore their use cases, and cover best practices to ensure you are always building APIs the right way like a pro. REST or Representational State Transfer relies on stateless communication where each request from a client to server contains all the information needed to process it. At the core of REST APIs are resources. A resource represents a thing or concept in your system that clients can interact with. Think of resources as nouns, such as users, products, orders, or anything your application manages. Each resource is identified by a unique URI or uniform resource identifier. For example, slash user slash 123 might represent a user with ID 123. And this could represent a product in your inventory. Resources are stateless, meaning all the information needed to interact with the resource is contained in the request itself. The server doesn't retain any client-specific session data between requests. To interact with these resources, REST APIs rely on HTTP methods, which define the action you want to perform. These methods are the verbs that bring resources to life. Understanding these methods is critical for designing APIs that are intuitive, maintainable, and aligned with REST principles. Now that we understand what resources are, let's explore each HTTP method in detail. In REST, HTTP methods map directly to CRUD operations, that is create, read, update, and delete, which define how a resource is created, retrieved, updated, or removed. And here is how the mapping looks like. The HTTP methods we use here, like get, post, put, patch, and delete, are the means by which these requests specify the action to perform. The get method retrieves data from the server. Think of it as reading a record without making any changes. For example, in an e-commerce API, this retrieves the product with ID 123. Here is what you need to know about the get method. First off, it's item potent which is just a fancy way of saying that making the same GET request multiple times will always give you the same result, as long as the resource hasn't changed on the server. And remember, GET is read-only. It's strictly for fetching data and shouldn't make any changes to the resource. Now, for best practices, you should always use clear hierarchical endpoints. For example, slash users slash ID to get details for a specific user, or slash users to fetch all users. And you should never include sensitive data in the URL. Keep that info in headers or the request body. And always return the right status code. So for example, 200 OK if everything is good, and 404 not found if the resource doesn't exist. And that's how you keep your GET requests clean and predictable. When you want to create a new resource on the server, you should use the POST method. For example, creating a new user. The server process the request creates the resource and responds with 201 created status code along with the location of the new resource. Since POST is all about creating new resources, you want to ensure every request coming in is clean and secure. First and foremost, validate the payloads. The step is critical to avoid accepting invalid or even malicious data. For instance, if you are creating a user, make sure fields like email or name are properly formatted and don't allow anything that could harm your system like unexpected scripts or SQL injections. More importantly, document everything clearly. Your API consumer should know exactly what's required in the payload and what's optional. For example, if email is mandatory but phone number is optional, spell it out in your API documentation. Trust me, this saves developer a lot of guesswork and prevents unnecessary errors. We'll talk more about documentation in my upcoming video. The PUT method is used to update an existing resource by replacing it entirely. If the resource doesn't exist, some APIs might also create it. Now, one of the main distinctions between PUT and POST is the concept of item potency. In an ideal REST design, PUT is intended to be item potent, meaning that sending the same PUT request multiple times results in the same final state on the server. In contrast, POST is generally non-item potent. 
So repeating the same post request could lead to multiple resource creations or side effects. For example, updating a user's profile. The server replaces the user's profile with a new data provided. And like I earlier mentioned, there is a commonly taught textbook mapping of HTTP methods to CRUD operations. However, textbook REST always says put is for update or replace, while post is for create. Now while using put, we combine both creation and replacement under one endpoint, a pattern known as upsert. Remember, put is all about updating or sometimes replacing a resource entirely. That means you have got to handle it carefully to avoid unintended consequences. So first, make sure the request includes all the required fields. And here is why. When you send a put request, you are typically replacing the entire resource. So if you leave out any fields, they might get removed from the resource altogether. For example, if you are updating a user's profile and you forgot to include their email in the payload, you might accidentally wipe out the field in the database, which is not good. Next, don't use put for partial updates. That's a job for patch, which is designed specifically for modifying just a few fields without touching the rest of the resource. Using put for partial updates can create confusion and inconsistencies in how your API behaves. So, when you only need to modify certain attributes of a resource, use patch. Unlike put, where you replace the entire resource, patch is for making partial updates. This means if you only want to update a single field, like a user's email address, you can do just that, leaving all other fields untouched. For example, updating the email field won't touch the name, address, or any other details in the user's profile. You must also ensure partial updates don't create inconsistencies. For example, if a patch request updates a product's price but forgets to update the associated tax calculation, your data could become inconsistent. And here is a simple patch request to update the price of a product. Now, let's assume the tax is calculated as 10% of the price. If your server doesn't automatically update the tax field when the price changes, the data might look like this. And this inconsistency could cause incorrect totals, customer confusion, or reporting errors. And so, to maintain a coherent state, your server should validate and update related fields automatically. And here is how you could do it in your code example in Node.js Express Server. By designing your server logic to validate and update related fields, like recalculating taxes when the price changes, you ensure your data remains consistent and accurate. When the server updates the price and automatically recalculates the tax, the response will look like this. If the update is successful and you are returning an update resource, go with 200 OK. And if there is no additional data to send back, 204 no content is a great choice. It tells the client everything went fine without unnecessary data. Let's talk about delete method, one of the simplest but also most misunderstood HTTP methods. Delete is all about removing a resource, for example, deleting a user account. But there are few important characteristics and best practices you need to keep in mind to use it effectively. First of all, delete is idempotent. What does that mean? It means sending the same delete request multiple times will always result in the same state. For example, if you delete a user with ID 123, sending that delete request again doesn't break anything. It just confirms the resource no longer exists. Next. Delete can be safe if it is designed well. Removing resources sounds straightforward, but you need to be careful. If the resource you are deleting is connected to other resources, like a user with associated orders, you need to decide how to handle those relationships. For example, will the orders also be deleted or will they remain intact with the user's deleted flag? Designing this logic carefully is critical to avoid unintended consequences. You should also consider using soft deletes because sometimes, Permanent deletion isn't the best choice, especially if you need to retain data for auditing or recovery. A soft delete marks the resource as inactive instead of actually removing it. For example, instead of deleting a user, you might set a deleted add timestamp. This way, the resource is gone for regular use but still exists in your database for future reference. And finally, there are other HTTP methods like head and options, but they are less commonly used in most APIs. The head method is like a lightweight version of get. It retrieves only the headers from the server, skipping the actual response body. This makes it useful when you just need to check if a resource exists 
or get metadata about it without downloading the entire content. So let's say you want to verify that if a file exists on the server before you download it. If the file exists, the server might respond with something like this. But there is no body in the response. You can also use head for validating content size before downloading it using the content length header. The options method is used to describe the available operations for a resource. It's often used in course or cross-origin resource sharing pre-flight request, where a browser asks the server what is allowed to do before even sending the actual request. And here is a simple example when a client makes an options request. The server might respond with this. This tells the client what methods are allowed and provides headers for CORS. In REST APIs, resources and HTTP methods work together to create a way for clients and servers to communicate. By using the right HTTP method for each operation and following best practices, you can ensure your APIs are clean, scalable, and maintainable. In our next video, we'll explore advanced REST API design best practices and design patterns. But for now, practice these principles and take your API design skills to the next level.